getting, and Linda and I have been getting a, a good bit of sad news in these last number of days. And before I forget, are we hearing anything new about Barbara? Barbara Camp? Um, I think she's just recovering, as far as I know. I haven't heard anything. Still in the recovery. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Doing uh, well, as far as I've heard. A, a, a dear uh, friend of ours, his young wife, um, uh, died just a couple of mornings ago. She was a little bit hurt, a very gentle girl, um, hurt uh, socially and perhaps uh, mentally, uh, but but just, just a gorgeous young woman. And her husband adored her, uh, Ed Powers. And uh, if you knew the fella, you would know uh, the anxiety and the hurt, just his makeup and uh, others we've heard of recently. Uh, there's a lot of death and a lot of serious illness going on. Uh, and Christians, you see, Christians. And I purpose to uh, read this prayer and I'm joining it with Alan's um, rich, truth-filled prayer. So I'm, I'm reading it. It's a George Matheson hymn prayer, yes? And um, the pronouns are singular, I, my, me, that kind. So as we pray, um, I'll be wanting you and you will want also to make this your prayer also. Will you do that, please, while we pray together for a moment or two? Holy One, who are love, and always do what is right. You who do more than what is right, but who out of love you do allow to be done what is lovingly right as you bring your eternal promise to a glorious finale. And so we pray to you as the embodiment of love. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe that in thine oceans depths its flow may fuller, sweeter be. All light that lightens all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. I now return my borrowed ray that in the sunshine of your day my path may clearer be. Oh, joy that seeketh me through pain, I cannot hide my heart from thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain, and I know the promise is not vain. That morn, it'll be tearless thee. A cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to hide from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead, and from the grime their blossoms red. Life, life that shall endless be. This prayer. We together pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Sometimes, 
sometimes the glory that we um, lay down in the dust is the glory that we've learned in our friendships, husbands and wives, parents and children through age or disease or accident wherever and loving them as deeply as we do and enjoying in Christ also the relationship. We glory in them. And we hear Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that the woman is the glory of man. So that when we lose a beloved and we put them down into the dust, we put a supreme glory that God has given us there. But as Matheson said for us, and as we have approved of it and believe it, that morn, that morn of resurrection will be a resurrection to life. And it will be a morning that is tearless. Yeah. How can we be sure of all that? What, because we feel this way? Because there are times when we want to believe and, and don't like the notion that when she or he dies and they go down, that that's the end of it all? Is that it? That's the basis of it? Because we want it to be true? That's why we say such things and pray such prayers. Why we preach and teach and you women who teach and share with other people. Do we do all of that because it's what we want to believe? Hmm. No, no, that's not it at all. We certainly want it to believe want to believe it, we want it to be true. But Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 14 says, as God, here it is, here it is. Here's why you and I could pray such prayers. As God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, even so, will he make your mortal bodies alive in resurrection? So that we pray these prayers, believe this to be true, not because it's a dream that we dream, not because it's a longing that we long for, because Christ has risen because something happened to an actual person who came. God in and as him visiting our mortal world as this mortal Jesus of Nazareth, who then lived against all the wickedness who then freely, see, see, this is important, and I know you know it, but, but this is too joy, full and filled for us not to tell it to one another again and again. It is because he said, watch me, watch me. Watch what I do. 
with my mortal body. I became flesh, human, just like you. Watch what I did with it. I lived what you cannot do, but I lived sinlessly, warm, righteousness, ceaselessly to my father, giving him what he fully merits, the love of a son of God and a daughter of God. I did that in my mortal life. And then watch me, he says, John 10, 17 and 18. You know why my father loves me? Because I lay down my life that I might take it again. But are you watching me? Verse 18, I let it down of myself. Nobody took it from me. Watch me, what I'm doing with mortal life, the life that you share together. That mortal life, I let it down. I went to the cross. I let it down. That I might take it again. Are you watching me? He says to us, watch me. And when you watch me and you see what I do, I do it for you. And I not only did do it, I could do it. And I did it because I could. And I did it because I wanted to. And I did it because I, I knew I could defeat death. And I did. And I did it for you. Look at Sarah. You long for resurrection. You long for glory. You long for endless, tearless life. You want it. You want it not just for you. You want it for all your beloveds in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you would want it for all of those who are not yet in him. You would want all of that for anyone. It's so rich, so good, so wondrous. You'd want it for anyone. Yeah. And it's why Every now and again, when you look at the TV and the news and all that, and see all oh, the brutality and the abuse and the loneliness and the hurt and the poverty and humiliation, and all of that, you wish that you could bring them into your own heart and walk them up to Jesus Christ and introduce them to him and bring them to faith in him. Yeah. What you have ahead of you, he says, watch what I do. Not only teach, though that's connected. Not only what I say and teach, watch what I do. I go to die. I go there to die, to tell you I'm ending my mortal flesh phase before that I might take it up again in 
immortality and in corruption. First Peter 3, 18, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 4. He said, are you watching? I don't only do it for me. You would be happy for someone like me to win. You would say, good for you, Jesus, if anybody ever merited resurrection. You're it. And of course, that's true. But I didn't do it just for me. I did it for you. I do it for them. I do it. I can't help it. It's who I am. I and my father are twins. We have within us nothing but love for the human family. Though they care not for us. All we ever wanted and purposed. And now purpose still is, is for them. And you now who I've drawn you who met me and said, oh, yes, I want you to cut me in, Lord, for you, for you, life, so, so, when your day comes, and there are some of us here who are in that age bracket, our day's coming soon. And he says, think of me. Think of what I'm telling you. Think of what I'm showing you and what I do. You see that mortal phase of life that you now enjoy? And that I want you in the world to live out as a witness to me. You see that life, that mortal life, when your time comes, lay it down. Lay it down. Trust me. I'd never disappoint you. If you have your moments, because this world, beyond this world, is at least it's not your experience right now. And it's, it's to that degree unknown. I get that. I understand. But look at me. Would I lie to you? You say, never. Good. Good. Believe me, and if at times you're troubled, hear me tell you, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. There are many rooms, mansions. If it were not, if it were not so, <laughs> I would have told you. Isn't he beautiful? Isn't he really something that the world looks at him and sees nothing? It's tragedy beyond. The tragic. But look at you. You 
he drew you, he kept whispering to you through fathers, mothers, grandparents, Sunday school teachers, friends, events, all of that, and all that marvelous way of his that is beyond our finding out through us. And look at you. Look at you. Your day's coming. Your day's coming not only to leave this mortal phase. Your day's coming to leave this mortal phase, which is your door into life with Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 21 and following. And then waiting. Happily. I don't know what goes on in between the time when we wait to the resurrection day, when we are fully glorified, re-embodied, expanded in all our feelings and our joys, in our vision to be able to see and enjoy righteousness. When we not only get a glorified body, we become glorified people. All of that growing into more and more the likeness of God. Yeah. And then the resurrection day when we're fully glorified and being God's companions forever. That's what's ahead for you. Yeah. Which is why Matheson will say, you've got plenty of hurts. You've been through plenty of hurts. You may have some more coming up between this and that. But he says, oh, joy that seekest me through pain. I cannot hide my heart from you. I trace. <laughs> With God's help, I trace the rainbow through the rain and know the promise is not vain. That day will tearless be. Yeah. And so when we lay down our loved ones, and Linda's going to lay down me. So and so is going to lay it. It's going to happen, don't you see? We didn't think, did we? That we were not going to die. We will. We knew. We knew it's going to happen. And there will be lo loved ones who will lay us down and they'll hurt, you know, and they'll, they'll cry for a while. But because you are you, because Christ is in you and you've embraced him and you will not walk away. And because he is your life even now. You live even now as a Christian. And yet, says Paul, Galatians 2, 19, 20. I through the law died to the law, that I might live unto Christ. God, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in this mortal phase, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, yeah. So the cross of Christ. 
followed by the resurrection. Always, the cross should never be, cannot ever be, must not ever be kept alone. Well, like the resurrection and the glory that all that means, it cannot be that. For Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 15, no resurrection? Then Christ? hasn't risen. And if Christ hasn't risen, we have nothing to preach. We have nothing to believe. Those of us who said we saw him alive in resurrection, we've lied and been false witnesses to God. We're still in our sins. We're still in our sins if he's not raised. Huh. And all of those who trusted their lives to him and died trusting him, if he's not raised, they've they perished. My Ethel doesn't exist anymore. Your husband, your wife, your fathers, mothers, your children, your closest friends, all of those who trust no resurrection. And Jesus, him too, been dead now for 2,000 years. And we've been singing and saying and preaching and this, that, and the other. We've been saying he's alive. Paul said, you know, of all the people in the world who are most miserable, us, we have been calm. And the God, we brag on the one that Christ said, even as he was dying on a cross, Father, into your hands, I trust myself. And God did not fulfill, was not faithful. To that young man who gave him everything. What a God. No resurrection. Please. We're not putting away the cross. We cannot do that. We don't want it. Without the cross, there is no resurrection for pity's sake. Without the cross, there is no clear, sustained demonstration that God loves us. John says in 1 John, you know how we know what love is? He says it more than once. Do you know how we know what love is? Because God sent his son and he died for us. Yeah, but he's alive. He's alive. And if that's true, you, you, right this minute, and in a coming day, the resurrection day, you will be fully redeemed. But redeemed now you are. And listen. Listen, listen. In Christ, not out of Christ, in Christ, you, you are indestructible. Could you walk away from him? Well, you, of course. You're planning on that? Never. So what, what do we mean? When we say, when I said, but you believe this, 
you do believe is what I'm saying. I'm not ordering you to believe it. I'm saying you believe this. This is your faith. You were indestructible for Jesus said. Nobody who believes in me dies. Even if they were to kill you bodily. Matthew 10, 28. Don't be afraid of anyone who kills your body. After that, they cannot do anything. They can't kill your body and soul. If you're going to fear somebody, fear him that can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. He said, nobody, same text, nobody can drag you out of my hand. He's the good shepherd who gives his life for you, John 10. Nobody can tear you out of my hand. He said, my father is greater than everybody, and nobody can tear you out of his hand. You know who you are? You're the indestructible people. Oh, but we're going to die bodily. <laughs> I know, so did Jesus. And he chose it. And he says to you and me, choose it. He does say that. When Peter in Matthew chapter 18, 16, when Peter in 16 hears Jesus talk about him being delivered up and dying, he won't have it. And he says in 16, 23, he said, no, no, that won't happen to you. You rebukes Jesus. And Jesus says, Satan, get behind me. What you cling to, what you insist on having, are the things that people grab and cling. He said, that's what you do. But I'm telling you, get behind me, Satan. Take up your cross. Follow me. Do with your mortal life what I'm doing with it. And he goes to the cross. And you, you. And Peter, of course, later, though he physically died on a cross, but you have already died. You've embraced Christ in faith. You have died already. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, Galatians 2. You have been crucified with him, made alive, and you now sit at God's right hand with him. Ephesians 2, 4, and following. You are already dead, sharing Christ's death. And when you were baptized in faith, what? You were baptized into him. You became part, identifying with him. Your members of his body. And then in the same text, Romans 6, 3, you were baptized into his death. By faith, you made his death yours. You said to him, I want yours. Okay, so maybe they're not going to kill you. Not likely they'll kill you. No. But you've already embraced the death of Christ for what it means. And because that's true, you now live. Peter? Peter? 
I've got 20 to 8. I'm doing all right. Am I counting? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're fine. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Peter. <laughs> Big old tough fella who could curse real fun. A little girl intimidated him. Others did too, but she was the last straw. And he begins to curse, saying, I don't know him. And then what happens? Later, the Christ is risen. He meets the risen Christ. Now he, rather than being intimidated, he goes into the lion's den, the temple with John and on other occasions, speaks to the big hitters that run the country almost. And the scripture says, and Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, you read Acts 3 and 4, yes? Acts 2 through 4, Acts 3 and 4, says to them, Filled with the Spirit, he says to them who told him, stop your preaching this junk. And he said, can't help it. We can't but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And when they're beaten up and they go back to their own, and they gather around and they begin to pray. They don't pray in Acts 4 for muscles. They don't pray for armor to protect them from the beatings. You know what they pray for? Boldness to speak. That's what the text says. And when they did, the whole building shook. Only the building shook. The men and women didn't. Yeah. And you? And you? Same thing. Paul says to the Ephesian Christians, don't be filled with wine. That's debauchery. Be you filled with the Spirit and speak one to another. Make melody, sing and make melody in your heart. Now, what happens when you're filled with compassion? What happens if you're filled in those moments, in those hours, in that day, when you're filled with compassion, what do you do? When you're filled with it, it has control of you at that, in those moments. And you, nobody has to tell you. Act compassionately. You can't help it. For in those moments, in that hour, in that day, you're filled with compassion. And so that's what you do. Filled with joy. And what do you do? You grin all over. You sit there smiling and nobody knows what you're smiling. And you don't care. You're smiling. Nobody has to come to you and say, you need to smile. You smile if you're filled with joy, filled with compassion, filled with anger. Nobody, nobody needs to tell you. You need to act angrily. You can't help it. Filled with the spirit. It's a metaphor, of course. When the scriptures speak about the spirit being poured out, it's a liquid metaphor. Big, big. Water, living water, poured out. The spirit fills you. Like compassion and joy and the other things fill you. And when the spirit fills you, you act under his impulse. 
And while it comes and goes, the filling moments come and goes. But when the scriptures speak of men who are, or women who are full of the Spirit, that means it's characteristic of them. And every time you look around, they are filled with the Spirit and acting under his impulse and leading and drive and energy. Uh -huh. You, when you're filled with the Spirit in those moments, you are not just one. You're a thousand years. Peter, when he's filled with the Spirit, he in one Peter, he's an army. And you, when you're filled with the Spirit, dear God, you're a man of war, a woman of war, and war against the powers that would drag you down. You're unbeatable. You're indestructible. You're more than one. You're you and the Spirit of God. And how, what can we do to become filled with the Spirit? It's a big old, you know, life is so complex. There's no way to get around these uh, and explain all these big issues and all of that. You can't even explain a single life. You know that. But just the same. We're not completely ignorant. How do you get to be filled with the Spirit? Paul says, be filled. So it must be possible. Yeah. And Peter, it happened to Peter, happened to Paul. In chapter 13, Paul, filled with the Spirit, said to Elimus, that absolute reprobate, this, this, and this. How do you get to be filled with the Spirit? You hang around good company. Hang around people like you. When I say people like you, I'm not trying to be just sweetie and sugary and syrupy. I really do believe in you. Oh, no, isn't Jim so sweet? No, 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 that's not what I mean to convey. But I do believe in you. Your faith in him is the witness that God lives within you. For your faith, Philippians 1, 29. Philippians 1, 29 is his gift to you. For it has been given unto you not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. And that word given is a big compound verb. A kariste, given to you as a gift. Some versions render it that way, and I think they should. I believe in you. And when you're filled with the Spirit, you're more than one person. Yeah. The world, the world in which we live, we war against the evil powers. And the evil powers are strong. They're embedded in the human family. Not every man, woman, boy, and girl. No, no, no. But, but, but all over influences has more power. The whole world, says 1 John 5, 17, is under the sway of the evil one. That world you wrestle against, and so do non-Christians. And that's why it gets worse and worse and has been bad since the day we walked out of the garden away from God. Yeah. The flesh, the mortal fades and mode of living. The flesh lusts against the spirit, 
and the spirit against the flesh. Galatians 5. Yeah. So that you would not do the things you would. Christ asked in John, I'm nearly done. Uh, I'm nearly done. You're doing well, all right? Uh, Christ in John 17. Uh, I did say 17, didn't I? 17, 14 to 19. He says in there, Father, I give them your word. They received it, and the world hates them. Not every man, woman, boy, and girl. This satanic world. This universal culture of evil that affects and corrupts people, that world, he said, the world hates them, says the same thing in John 15. Yeah. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love you as one of its own. But because you're not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, the world hates you. And Jesus in John 17 says, the world hates them, Father. I pray not that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. He didn't say that for nothing. You really are people at war. Am I screaming and giving you a headache? Am I? No? All right. C.S. Lewis in his little book. Uh, I forget the name of the, yeah, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. He likens the world, and this was 1923, just after the war and all of that, and he spoke of Jesus like the leader of a resistance movement. And he came into the world as an enemy of Hitler and everything, the, all that he stands for, he came in to undermine him as a usurper. Satan, as Hitler standing for Satan, usurped power. And Christ comes in as a resistor, a leader of it. And, and he called you. To follow him, and you are a resistant movement going around, laying explosions here and there, words, speech, conduct, smiles in the right place, warmth as God enables you when it's needed, forgiveness when it is asked for, all of that, and you are going around. Resisting the usurper. And Christ assures us, you win in the end. And after all his promises, what? One of these nets, if not already, feebleness is going to come up to you. And look at you. Ha! Look at you. And because you're Christ's, because you know what's ahead, and because you're filled in these moments with the Spirit, you'll say, Yeah, I know what you're on about. Let me tell you, I'm going to meet you again one of these days, and I'm going to show you what to be ever young males means and then death comes knocking on your door and you say oh there you are i was expecting you and you couldn't have come unless you were given permission 
from my Lord. Here's a piece of a Herbert, George Herbert poem. Yes, I wish I could quote it. I hate to read and have my head done when you're up there and I can't see you. It's disgusting. But there it is. I can't quote it. But here it is. George Herbert died in the 1600s. One of the best poets around. Not always easy to read, but here, this is easy to read. Death approaches. And he says to death, the swagger's in. Alas, poor death, where is your glory? Where is your famous force, your ancient sting? And he's mocking death. Death says, alas, poor mortal, you don't know your own story. Go and read how I killed your king. And Christian said, poor death. And who was hurt by that? Your curse led on him, made you twice a curse. And death, trembling, begins to bluster and says, let losers talk, yet you shall die. These arms will crush you. And you say, Christian says, oh, spare not, do your worst. I shall one day be better than before. And you, so much worse, but you shall be no more. All of that, just a piece of poetry? Heavens no. All of that based on what? A young, ever young Lord, King, and Savior who rose from the dead, having defeated death. And with this song, then I'm done. I would like you, if you saw fit, to do this. This is a song written by Don Francisco. It's called, He's Alive. You can find it on YouTube, yes? Here it is. The song is Peter, Peter's angle on it all, okay? So when we hear him say, talk, it's Peter talking. I'm almost done. God bless you for being here. God bless you for your attentiveness. God bless you for your love for God. God bless you for your continuing, stubborn, happy faith. Yeah. And here's why. Here's why you continue to hold faith. Peter, the gates and doors were barred, all the windows fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness and rose at every sound. Half in hopeless sorrow and half in fear of the day would find the soldiers breaking through and drag us all away. And just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. The gate began to rattle and a voice began to call. I hurried to the window, looked down in the street, expecting swords and torches and the sound of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary. So I went down and let her in. John stood here beside me as she told me where she'd been. 
said they'd moved him in the night. None of us knows where. The stone's been rolled away, and now his body isn't there. We both ran toward the garden. John ran first ahead. We find the stone in the empty tomb, just like Mary said. But the winding sheet they wrapped him in was just an empty shell. And how or where are they taking him was more than I could tell. Something strange had happened there. Just what? I didn't know. John believed a miracle. But I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation didn't lift me very high. Because I had, I had seen them crucify him, and I had seen him die. <clears throat> Back inside the house again, the guilt and anguish came for all the things I promised him. I just denied it. Name. When at last it came to choices, I denied his name. And even though he was alive, even if he was alive, even if he was alive, it wouldn't be the same. But suddenly the room was filled with strange and sweet perfume. Life that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room. Jesus stood before me and his arms opened wide. I got done on my knees and I clung to him and cried. He raised me to my feet and as I looked into his eyes, love was shining out of them like sunlight from the sky. Guilt in my confusion disappeared in sweet release and every fear, every fear I'd ever have had melted into peace. He's alive! He's alive! He's alive and I'm forgiven! Heaven's doors open wide! He's alive! He's alive! And while the author doesn't say it. He allows us to have Peter run down the steps into the street in the darkening, the dark of the early morning. He runs up and down the street yelling, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. That's why you're here. That's why you said, cut me in. That's why you're never going to quit. That's why you're going to give it your best shot. That's why when your moment comes and it's time to leave here and go, you're going where he is. Yeah. And even now, if, if you're still anguished over someone that you've lost recently, you know, you would say to him, look, I know I can't get him back. I, I know I can't get her back. But because he had to go, or she had to go, there's no one. I would want him or her to go to.
but you and I know I can't get her back, but is it all right if I ask you if you'll have one of your best angels look after him, look after her. They loved you so much. Borrowed that line from Kate Rusby's song, My Young Man. You can find that too. A lovely thing to hear. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Thank you for them. Thank you for them with the way they model faith in you and have done that in the years. And those I've known well and spoken to on and off done the years and find them to be unchangingly yours. Give them joy in times of trouble. Help them, fill them with your spirit and make them more than one. Help us to see the rainbow through the rain. Thank you for Kevin who helps to have all this, the, the privilege to do all of this. Yes. Give us more times together if it suits your will. We thank you, thank you, thank you. We thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.